and friendship. We don't always agree on most of the issues, but we we had uh, many lunches and dinners down in Charleston, and we got along really well. And and, and he sits right behind me um, on the floor. Um, so I just want to thank you for that friendship, Gino. Uh, of course, of all the people that I have been very blessed with to have around me in Charleston, physically and uh, and, and otherwise on, on the floor, I'm, I'm glad that one of them gets to be you. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into it, Gino. Um, when we first, we, we, uh, we first, I kind of want to talk a little bit about when we first met um, on the floor, you had introduced what I call the no fun bill. Um, but you, <laughs> tell us the story of how that kind of came about and how it grew into that behemoth of a bill that uh, is now a, a, a uh, study resolution. So the, the, the genesis of that bill really came from one of my initial legislative goals going down to Charleston, I wanted to try and help clean up some of the uh, more dastardly parts of, of Morgantown. Morgantown has a lot of problems. As you, you over in Berkeley County, I'm sure you've, you've seen some of the, the problems of having a more populated area. And the, the, the premise of the bill, it started very simple. What I wanted to create was a bill that would restrict the physical sale of um, pornographic materials. So I sent that idea to the bill drafting department, and what they came back with was this incredibly detailed and um, really, really thorough bill that went well, well beyond the, the, the initial idea, um, and it started including things like um, public obscenity, and, and it included uh, strip clubs would be affected by that. So. All things that I personally agree with, I wanted to start really, really small, but this, this huge bill came back, and I, I shared it with a couple of other delegates, and they generally liked the idea. They thought it was uh, uh, a tough sell for sure, but I thought I would throw it out there as, as, a, as an anchor point and kind of let people know that there is this idea that is brewing among certain delegates that they want to see some, uh, some sort of common morality type thing. So I, uh, I threw it out there. And as you know, a couple news networks picked it up because it is a little bit uh, aggressive. And, and I knew that going in. Um, but I, I don't think that it's too far off from the, the, the vision that not only some delegates have, but a lot of people in West Virginia have is a lot of the, um, a lot of people are getting very, very comfortable nowadays. And I think that uh, there is this desire among the constituents here to sort of see some decency return. Hi, John Gilstrap. Good morning. Uh, this seems like a very, forgive me, left-wing kind of idea to tell people what they can do in their private lives. I mean, for the record, I don't object to any of this stuff as far as porn is concerned. I understand there's some of that on the Internet if that's where people want to go. But if, um, you know, public obscenities and strip clubs and that sort of thing, why is that the government's business I mean, as long as these clubs pay their taxes and they obey health codes and the food is cooked properly and and, and and drinks are sold legally why is it the government's responsibility to get involved with any of that so i would say that it go, it's starting to go beyond the point of where it's no longer people just doing things in their private lives um, former delegate kayla kessinger and i have spoken a lot about this as well is that there is this problem that is going on especially in southern parts of the state where a lot of these places, especially like strip clubs, where it's there are a lot of valid human trafficking concerns, human rights concerns. Kayla Kessinger brought a lot of uh, this big group of women and parents and kids to, to my office to discuss this with me. And it's something that we plan on looking at further on. But it, that specifically is something that I would like to look into as well. And that is why that premise of the bill made it into a... Uh, into a study resolution because if it really is going beyond um, what people are doing, you know, in the privacy of their own bedrooms, I definitely think it's something that the the government needs to address because it involves human rights. We can we can stipulate that we can stipulate that that human trafficking is is bad and it's against the law already. Uh, but the fact that human trafficking happens on a street corner, we don't outlaw street corners. This kind of this is the same logic is that because people die of gunfire we should outlaw guns. If 
it, the issue is, as I look at it, the issue is not the strip club. The issue is the human trafficking. Well, I mean, if if, if we could do something to assist in that fight against uh, a heinous evil like human trafficking, I definitely think it's our responsibility. And, and unfortunately, for strip club owners, owning a strip club isn't in the isn't in the Bill of Rights. So where did the uh where did it end up, Gino? Did uh, I, I know towards the end of the session you were very excited that you got a uh, study resolution or something like that? How, how does that work? So what's going to happen is there is going to be a, a review and data is going to be collected during the, during the off-season. Um, more Capito was, um, and he, he spoke to me about it towards the end of the session, and he agreed that it was something that uh, they could definitely send to a study resolution. So data is going to be collected. They're going to assess what the situation is 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 like, and if there is some sort of need, if they determine that there is an actual issue, then we could take a more a more serious look at it. So let's switch gears just a little, Gina. What was your thoughts on your first session um, down in Charleston, and what were some of the key takeaways or key bills that you were either proud or not so proud to be a part of? So I think that, well, first of all, as far as my thoughts on the first session goes, it was a lot of exactly what I thought it would be in, in a lot of ways. And in, and in others, I think it was nothing like that I thought it was going to be. I thought that when we got down there, um, and maybe this just was the, the stars in my eyes for my first session, I thought, well, you know, there's, there's 88 of us going down here, 88 Republicans. We should be slam dunking issues left and right. This should be no problem. And then once I got down there, I realized just how much variety our party has for, for better or for worse. Um, so uh, I got the, the full picture of just how slow state government actually moves. So that was something. But as far as specific legislation goes, um, uh, I really was glad to see us take a stand against the, the transgender surgeries against minors. I think that was a good one, and as you know, we most of us were a part of voting yes for the the, the biggest tax cut in state history. I think that was another one that was pretty prominent. Uh, I think my biggest regret as a whole was not something that we did; it was something that we didn't do. And I don't think that we took any major, meaningful steps towards reducing the substance abuse problem in the state. That's where most of my career expertise comes from, whether it's direct experience with people suffering from addiction or uh, a career line that is. Uh, adjacent to its effects. Um, I wish we did a little bit more to that, but as you obviously know, that is a, a complex issue that has a lot of different viewpoints contributing to it. Delegate, <clears throat> excuse me, Delegate Chiarelli, um, I'm the yeah. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney, and so, so you just mentioned this, uh, an area that's that I'm very familiar with as well, and substance abuse and, and the tools that we need to, so we can do our job to help in, in this issue. Where, where do you see that we're lacking that that the state government can fix in this epidemic? So my, my belief from based off of my experience so far, I used to work for Child Protective Services, so I saw what a lot of untreated substance abuse can do to a community, and I also worked as a substance abuse counselor, so I've seen what kind of pe what people look like when they're attempting recovery uh, of some kind. So I think that there needs to be a two-pronged approach, and I've been saying this for, for a little while. I think that when it comes to a... Um, the end user, I don't think that someone's first nonviolent possession charge should automatically be criminal charges that stick with them for the rest of their lives. So I would like to see, at, at, the, at the very least, more treatment options. Um, what that does not mean is I don't want to see a methadone clinic on every single street corner because I understand the concerns around that. And I used to work at a methadone clinic, so... Um, uh, I, I do get why people are, are skittish with that kind of thing, but I do think that there does need to be more more treatment options available for end users. I don't think that criminal charges um, are necessarily going to solve addiction at that level. However, on the flip side, where I think there does need to be criminal and um, legal involvement is I think that we need a zero tolerance policy when it comes to distribution. Anybody that is um, trafficking, especially fentanyl, or meth is, is, is an outrageous problem. I think that's where we need legal consequences to the point where no one would even, in their right mind would ever dream of bringing drugs here specifically to make money off of people's uh, sickness.
Gina, didn't we do that back in the 80s with the crack cocaine, cocaine kind of thing when it was, if crack cocaine it, 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 are these huge stiff sentences, um, aren't, aren't these people who are trafficking just the mules? Or, I mean, why aren't we going after the, the, the root of the problem? Well, I, I think that these, these kind of puny, uh, penalties on the people that are bringing drugs into the state, this is really how it starts. It's going to be tough because it does require multi-state cooperation because, as you know, it isn't just a West Virginia-specific problem. It's not only an Appalachian problem. It's an entire world problem. So yeah. what we need is some level of state cooperation. But when it comes to West Virginia specifically, what I feel like we could do from our perspective is – we can broadcast the statement, we are open for business, economically speaking, but we are not open for business when it comes to uh, any sort of illicit drug dealings. We have to, we have an obligation to protect our people, and if that means imposing serious penalties on people that think about coming here to do that, I think it's something that we need to more seriously explore. Delegate uh, against Matt Harvey, um, so in a lot of instances that we see here in the Panhandle, and I'm sure it's the same in Mon County, is you have uh, a couple individuals that will have maybe forty, sixty dollars between them, and they'll they'll drive to Baltimore and buy enough that they can use to to get well, and then they'll sell the proceeds so they can keep that cycle up. It, that that's the the majority of our our dealers, quote unquote, in West Virginia are, you know, also users. They're not the the big names that come in with a tractor trailer full of drugs and it's distributed in right. those hubs. So how would you? Do you, is there a distinction in your mind when you're talking about these uh, stiffer penalties for dealers? So as much as I would like to specifically isolate the the big stereotypical, you know, hidden in the back of a trailer kind of thing, uh, I do think that we are at the point now where, as you know, the, the addiction problem is, despite what surveys and polling and optics might say to the average person who's unaware of this kind of thing, the, the addiction problem is getting worse, especially post-COVID. So I think that if you really are part of the reason why these kind of drugs keep cycling through the community, I do think that we need to look at actual penalties for you. Um, you know, using is, is, is one thing, but if you're part of the problem, if you're part of the cycle, if you keep selling to other people, uh, I, I do see a, a spot for you in jail. And Gina, we, we talked about um, getting help for people that, that are, you know, have substance abuse or are addicted shouldn't do don't these people want don't they have to want help first um we can't you get you know arrested for using or or you, cps reports you or something like that um providing clinical help if somebody doesn't want help how often does that work in your in your experience well uh recovery is an intrinsic motivation thing people have to want to change. And that is why I personally have seen so much success when I used to work in a methadone clinic is because n well over 90% of the people that I dealt with there, they wanted to, to make a change in their life. And that's not saying that they show up in day one, you know, they're different people. It, it does take a, a while to, to fix the problem, but most of the people, I would say all the people that have found success there found it because they wanted. And I, I know that uh, not everybody wants wants help not everybody wants to get better it's the same principle that i see with a lot of the uh a lot of the homeless population here a lot of people have this perception of, of homeless people where it's kind of like oh they need help they just need a hand up why don't you start and talk to them i can also tell you working at a methadone clinic that i've dealt with a lot of the homeless people here a lot of them are not interested in any help they don't really care about rules that the rest of us have to abide by they really only care about sort of being public nuisances so if you want to change, it has to it has to come from within. I I, I agree with you 100. percent You know, actions have consequences, and consequences are caused by actions, right? So, <clears throat> there. It seems to me, and I, I'm well outside my area of expertise here, but it seems to me from interviews we've had with with various folks in in the studio here, there are several classes or several um, types of addicts. Some are you know, the opioid, the, the guy that has the, the, the bad back or the knee injury and, you know, d just ends up with an addiction to the, the uh, opiates. Sort of set them aside because uh, for the most part, it seems from what I've heard, they are willing to, to and anxious to recover. 
Then you have, and I think this is the really difficult part, particularly in a state like West Virginia, which is several states. There's a prosperous part of the state where I'm fortunate to live, and then there's a less prosperous part of the state. It seems to me that addiction is rooted in desperation in a lot of places. It's a desire just to escape. There's um, the economic opportunities in parts of the, of the, of the state are, are minimal. Education is bad. Uh, and in, in those circumstances, it, people, I believe, turn to drugs as a method of escape. So it seems to me solving the source, which would be making the parts of the state more prosperous, is kind of the, the way to get to the end of the addiction. Am I being naive here? No, I would say that that is a, uh, incredibly insightful. That is extremely astute. You're, you're spot on. There is that um, swath of people that back in the day they prescribed them this because no one was really being honest about what kind of uh, impact opioids would have on the body. So we, I've seen a lot of older gentlemen come in. They're on methadone. They were never even really illicit, quote unquote, illicit drug users because they just became chemically dependent on, on a certain substance. And there's a, pretty much as you described, there's a difference between someone who is chemically dependent and somebody who is an addict. Now, on the other hand, what you said about the, the economic opportunity, I think that drugs are a means of escapism, and I think that people turn to them in a lot, of, uh, in a lot of places because there's nothing else that the the community has to offer them other than some sort of illegal activity. So, um, the things that I, the things that I believe in, and the, uh, the things that we can do to fight addiction in the state, uh, I think are, I don't want to say band aids because I do think they're critically important overall. However, attacking the source of the problem is bolstering the community, providing economic opportunity giving people a reason to get up day to day that goes beyond I need to get high. So I think economic opportunity is a, is a huge thing. And I think that we're making some, some strides in it. I know that there was a lot of talk about economic development over the last, um, over the last session. A lot of people agreed on certain aspects of it and some people didn't, but generally speaking, I do think that we need to, to bolster the, um, the, the less affluent areas of the state for sure, because if people don't have any reason to function in society, how can we expect them to? You know, it's not all going. I want to go back to the, your second prong here when you talk about zero tolerance for distribution of certain drugs. It's not often I have an opportunity to talk to two delegates and a prosecutor. So here's the question How do we go about changing the laws and say that distribution of fentanyl is, in fact, attempted murder and, and prosecuted as such? And, and to follow up on that, would you support legislation that turned distributing fentanyl into an attempted murder charge? And I'd love Matt's thoughts on this, too. That's well, well, for me personally, I had a bill that um, I, I received and it had a lot of support. I was able to get 10 co-sponsors on it uh, in a matter of minutes, really. But it was a simple, simple premise of life in prison for fentanyl dealers. And a lot of people wanted to, a lot of delegates wanted to see something like that at the very least be brought up for discussion. But unfortunately, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't taken up in, in the substance abuse committee, which I regrettably am, am not on. But uh, um, I certainly... Mike knows my my stance on that, but I would love to hear that from the from a prosecutor's perspective as well. Well, it, it's not just as uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, and we see this right now is yeah. how does how does someone that's selling drugs like the the scenario that I described earlier about the people that are just trying to buy enough dope and sell it so they can stay well. And you, when you say stay well, you mean stay high, correct? Well, they you, you're high the first couple yeah, okay. times that you start abusing the drug, and then and then now the, after that, it, they don't really get high. They just have to take it so they can make so they can maintain their. They can just wow. feel normal, okay, in in a, in a sense, and function throughout the day. Um, I use coffee. Some people, you know, have a higher uh, addiction than that. But how do you know? If it's fentanyl, how do you, how can you prove? And uh, you can t test in the lab, but how do you show Im impart that knowledge prior to that person getting that substance? To well, say if, that it's if it was like it was cut with fentanyl, for instance. Everything's right? cut with fentanyl. Yeah. That's the problem. Right. Like you can get uh, gummies, um, you can buy a bag of marijuana, it's, and a lot of times it's going to have fentanyl in it. You can get what you think is a prescription pill off the street. And it's it's an image. So you would have to you would have to then prove intent. And that no, would be hard to prove there's a strict high. liability issue here. You I, the dealer has an obligation 
to know what he's selling, right? If, if Why don't we hold drug dealers to the same standard that we hold any other kind of Well, I'm, I'm just highlighting some of the issues. If yeah. you're going to, if you have a, like a, a, a naive dealer that doesn't know that's just passing a bag of weed onto someone else and has fentanyl on it, you, you know, is that... Is, is that the type of conduct that's contemplated for a life sentence? That's obviously a legislative question. Well, I would I would say yes. I mean, the actions have consequences. Consequences are the result of actions. So. Well, if if that's the, if 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 that I law was I, in place I, right now, then yeah. we would have everybody. Our jails would be we, overrun. Yeah, we'd have to. And they're, they're we, don't, already we don't have enough people to man yeah. the jails we have now. So it's a very like there's a lot of downstream effects as well. I, I'm not saying I'm a I'm for it or against yeah, yeah, it, I, I but agree. There's, there's a lot of considerations that, that the legislative process would have to iron out. And didn't we, didn't we fight this war on drugs? Haven't we been fighting it for, forever? F almost and 50 years? 50 years, yeah. and, and it seems like no matter, if it's not fentanyl now, it'll be something else down the road. Well, it's a war that we've been fighting for 50 years. There's, drugs are more prevalent, they're more lethal. And there's more people addicted. Yeah, so and I don't think, and, we're going and Gino might agree with me. I know this is not a popular opinion, but I, you know, I don't think legalizing marijuana helped any. I don't think that's curbed any addiction in in Colorado or California or anything else like that. I haven't seen solid numbers, but I, I sure haven't seen numbers go down. I tell you, the thing that it does address is, <clears throat> is it takes out some of the uncertainty of buying drugs off the black market. Yeah. And that's a real problem now with fentanyl that's invading everything. Um, Expand on that just a little. Well, it's it's being cut into yeah. every, because fentanyl's cheap. Fentanyl's cheaper than everything else. So if you can take that and, and people think that they're buying like a, a, a benzodiazepine and, you know, like a Xanax and it's actually fentanyl. And so you got some some person in a lab somewhere, who knows where, that's that's making this concoction. At least when it's legalized, it, it it's coming through a regulatory process. That's the, that's one benefit of do that. You, do you think the black market has gone down in the states that have legalized cannabis? I don't know. I haven't looked at yeah, that I, issue. I, I didn't know if you had I, any of those stats. I mean, it's, well, what you're what you're saying about expensive. fentanyl is is 100 percent true. It's cheap. People are using it to, to cut everything. I had a lot of patients come and tell me. Um, I had a lot of patients from a lot of walks of life, so thankfully I was able to get a lot of perspectives on this kind of thing. A lot of them now are telling me that they used to do heroin back in the day, but now you're, you're lucky if you can even find anything even close to what, to what heroin actually was because uh, fentanyl was so prevalent in, in the black market. And a lot of younger people that I saw that were addicted are telling me that they don't even bother looking for heroin because there's no point because heroin is um, nowhere near as powerful as fentanyl and it's it's much cheaper it's even getting into the if people are cutting meth with it and I had one patient tell me that he had a he had a, a meth problem was his his main issue but he was expressing to me one time that he was concerned because he felt like he had to do more and more and he felt like he had, would has typically been able to control how much he was using I know it's ironic for someone using meth to say but he said that he had it relatively well managed, but after extensive drug testing, after I sent off his, his urine sample for further analysis, it was revealed that when he changed dealers and he started getting meth from somebody else, that was cut with fentanyl. So it increases his desire for it, and that's one of the problems is because fentanyl is so addictive, it really, really gets people on the hook like like few other things. So. Um, it creates these permanent customers because of how how much they need it. Yeah, it's it's a it's unbelievable. I have a much more cynical take on this war on drugs. Right. We've never had a war on drugs. We've had uh, we've had political talking points and a pillow fight on drugs. A pillow yeah. fight on drugs, and it's it's like the the. Uh, immigration issue too. There are some issues at the national level that are such good debating points. I don't think there's an actual national commitment to end this. If we wanted to end it, if we, we wanted to have a war on drugs, we would have a like, war um, with the cartel. Yes. Yeah. And and go and destroy and stuff and blow stuff it. up. Yes. Yeah. I I kind of agree. With, with that said, we're going to take our first break. You know, you're going to have hear the commercials. We won't be able to hear us, but we're going to take a break. We'll be back in about two minutes. I'm going to switch gears here, Gina. We talked about stiffer penalties for, for dealing drugs. It, you know, we, we just, in West Virginia, we just got this massive civil um, uh, 
settlement. Settlement, right? Um, yet nobody from Big Pharma or any of those companies that did break the law in went out there and marketed these drugs and said they were non-addictive across the country and got millions of people addicted to, to, to drugs. Nobody served one day in jail. Your thoughts on that, Gino? Well, I mean, the, the legal ramifications for the, for the big pharma, for, for companies that knew what they were doing and just decided to do it anyway for, uh, for profit-motivated reasons, that's something that's going to have to be handled by people like our attorney general, people like federal prosecutors. It's, that's something that is unfortunately out of our control, I would say, as a, as a state legislature. But um, now all we can really do, at least what I feel like I can do, is sort of just try and deal with the fallout. It, it's tough because people in those positions of power, not even in just big, big pharma specifically, but in all industries, it feels like that they're capable of getting away with things that your average person can't. So we can lament all day about how unfair things like that are, and of course it, it absolutely is, but people like us are stuck trying to make sense of it all, trying to clean it up, and it, it's even worse for the people whose lives have been destroyed, whose families have been obliterated, but they really can't do anything. So I'm hoping and praying that this settlement money that we received actually goes towards meaningful measures to help alleviate some of the, the problems that we see from, from county to county. Were criminal charges ever filed in this case? It was strictly a civil case, right? Matt? I, 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 think there was I don't a, know. I think there was a fine. Maybe. Maybe there was a fine paid by the corporation. I, a, I don't think any actual criminal but, charges were filed. I think it was all civil. Um, from what I remember, I, I know Patrick Morrissey went, w was leading the charge, um, and, and I, I somebody you know, somebody in the comments Google it. I yeah, think it was a criminal. And I think case. actually uh, the skin of like law a firm, fine. Skin of, yeah, that's that's separate. See, Is that a different one? See the Sackler, the Purdue Pharma, they're not in this lawsuit. This okay. is the distributors. Okay, and and and. and this new round, there are some of the manufacturers, but you know, I, I believe that the Sackler family got away and is getting away currently with murder, to the tune of a hundred thousand people a year, and they unleashed this, and they knew better. I, those are the types of people that I'm really, I could really get behind some some legislation that would increase the penalties. They need to be set in a prison cell. They don't need to pay one tenth of their net worth and penalties. They need to have their liberties taken because they destroyed families. Yeah, I, f I would far they, rather see those people get. And until they do, we're just gonna keep, we're yeah. gonna get stuck in the cycle. And I'd far rather see people like that who have affected so much get a lifetime sentence than some guy selling a $60 thing and has fentanyl in it. And I, I also can agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I yes. agree, because yes. that's what the real war on drugs looks like. Well, and in in the break, John was uh, John was oh, saying, yeah, throw me under the bus. We, we are <laughs> going to throw you. The, the, uh, we were talking about the the war on drugs. Um, if we really want to attack this war on drugs, we have to do some some invading and some things that probably going to have to have access. Kill Congress. people and blow stuff yeah. up. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, that's what war is. That's what you're fighting. You're fighting against people that have as much money as a country. And you know, we know they, where they are. You know, certain, and of course, it doesn't. It does involve acts of war against another nation, but it's not really against the other nation. It's against bad guys, specific groups of bad guys within that right. nation. If, in fact, we're going to have a war on drugs, if we want to solve this problem, and, we need to and go looking, hot. And looking back, a lot of the times our government funded some of these cartels or picked mm -hmm, sides right. and, and, and actually helped these people do do the trafficking. So. It's, one of those things where you've got to tread lightly, if you will. You know, I'm, I'm typically, uh, I try to stay away from intervening to that degree. I try to avoid war as much as possible. I'm, I'm against death penalty and, and things of that nature. However, when it, if, if it comes down to actually waging legitimate war on cartels that are pumping, you know, millions and millions and millions of, of doses of illicit substances that are killing our people into our country, boot up. Okay, I gotta you know, say I mean, this shameless self promotion. That is the book I'm writing right now. Is that it? It is. Yes. Okay. We're, 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 we're going to war. So <laughs> just that would be out in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Who wins? Well, because look, I, at guys. some points, I mean, I, I'm against, I'm against war, but I'm especially against unjust war. However, if you can show me, if you can lay out a case, and apparently in your book that's coming, <laughs> the the justification for a truly just war, 
well, then you have my support. We could send it down to Bill Writing, see what they come up with, John, and then you don't have to write it. <laughs> it'll, it'll be, it'll be an encyclopedia by the time it gets back. Hey, Governor Justice is sending 50 National Guard troops down to the Mexican border. Yeah, I'd like, just to, have get your, keep going. I'd like to get the delegates' thoughts on that. That, that just happened this week on uh, Governor Justice sending 50 National Guard troops to the southern border. Do you know? Um, me, me personally, I think that that is uh, political optics. I, I really think that that is directly relevant to the fact that the governor is running for Senate. I don't think that 50 guards at the ta- uh, the West Virginia taxpayer expense going out or to, going down there to do busy work is necessarily the greatest idea. Uh, but in a vacuum, uh, in if we had a federal if we had a federal uh, government that was actually interested in enforcing our border and we wanted to send our people down there to do meaningful work, that kind of thing I'm in support of. But this specifically, this just seems like posturing to me. But that, isn't that where most of the, the illicit drugs that are coming into this country are, are coming through? Yeah, so, and, and I, I think that the, the premise of it is, is a good concept, it's a good idea, and I would support something like this if I thought that it was going to actually make a difference because reinforcing the border, I'm pro-border wall, I'm pro-having it staffed with, with military National Guardsmen uh, 24-7. I, I agree with all those kind of things, but I think right now Governor Just is doing this specifically it doesn't really feel like we're sending them down there to make any sort of genuine impact. It just seems like he's trying to make a spectacle. And we can only send it. we can only send fifty because the rest of them are in our Department of Corrections, and, and <laughs> that, that's kind of yeah, really. So we we have that, plenty of our own That's the issue we here, need to, to home, address locally. Believe me, I, I am one hundred percent, one hundred and fifty percent pro enforcing border law, building border wall, doing anything that we can to to physically. Uh, empower the separation between us and Mexico, but this specifically, this seems like a stunt to me. All right, I, it's the it's the gorilla in the room, right? So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw it out here. In the 1930s, the federal government said that that law-abiding people can't have a drink in their own home. Actually, that's not what it said. It said I can't buy or sell the alcohol to consume in my own home. Actually, consuming it was not a crime. Um, if we were to legalize what is now illegal in the, in the drug trade, the, the drug trade goes away, if we, right? It will continue to be a black market, but it would be much smaller. And with quality controls, you know, we get rid of... of um, yeah, let's get the, 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 let's the, get the government involved. And, and let me say for the record, I don't, this is not what I want to do. <laughs> But I can't justify it on on a rational level. It's just I think I think that that level of addiction is inherently harmful, and that we should protect people against it. Okay, but I can't justify it when saying if uh, rationally, if good scotch is legal, why can't good drugs be legal? Well, I mean, like like you said, I can't really endorse the the libertarian perspective when it comes to drugs because. I do not believe that it is a, a victimless, victimless crime. I do think that drug addiction is something that is, is dangerous. And, of course, as we know, alcohol addiction is dangerous. Tobacco and cigarette addiction is dangerous. But I don't think it's to the same degree that fentanyl, something like fentanyl is. I really don't see how allowing people to legally use fentanyl is going to improve our problems. I feel like it would only make access to it easier. More people are going to get addicted uh, and more people are going to forego their their obligation to be a productive, contributing member of society. I, I can't I can't get behind it. I've heard about it for a while. A lot of people believe in that kind of thing, but I cannot uh, I can't support. It. I'm also I, coming from a Christian conservative perspective. I can't endorse drug use on a That's on the, that level. It's commonly called the Portugal model, where you just legalize it and then treat people that are having trouble you know, managing after that. Instead of incarceration, do we really? I, I don't. I, I, this whole area is hard for me to comprehend. Um, however, we're on the radio, so uh, is there a large population of people who really want to become addicted and use drugs, and they're only not doing it because it's illegal? No, nobody wants to be a, a heroin addict. Nobody wants to be a, yeah, addicted to fentanyl. Right. So if you take the illegality out of it, if that's even a word. Um, does that really cause a spike in users, or is it just empty the prisons and and reduce the street drug trade? I don't know. I, don't yeah, know. I think there would be, we would see both effects. I think there would be 
both positive and negatives, but I can't help but think that if we make something more accessible to the public, I think more people are going to use it. And even if an addiction is relatively well managed, whatever that even means, it is still an addiction. I do think it is still destructive. And I don't think that we can increase, you know, the longevity and quality of people's lives if we let them have free, non, you know, unfiltered access to the finest quality fentanyl that they could find. It, well, and it also normalizes the behavior. Yeah. Which is, an, uh, which is another big issue. And I don't want us to treat this like, well, you know, it's a, it's a part of our lives that we have to ac uh, accept. I think it's something that we actively need to fight back against and one day, eventually, Pipe Dream eradicate it from public discourse because it is no longer a, no longer a mainstream talking point. Yeah, I think if you normalize it, too, it also hurts the structure of the, the family, if you will. And I, I think that's where, you know, Gene and I can, can, can agree on a lot of the, a lot of issues is um, faith and family are, are being forgotten in, in, a, in society these days. And I think that's part of the reason where we can just feel like we can do anything we want with no consequences. And I, I just, that's, so. and that's, I, I'm thinking about the CPS case I had specifically where, where a child went into the mother's purse and overdosed because there was an, un, uh, there was an opened unsealed bag of drugs in there. That's the kind of thing that I, I don't have the stomach to take. I was only in child services for two years total. And seeing those kinds of things, that I just I can't I can't get behind the idea of another child overdosing because mom had a bag of Molly in her purse. You know, it's just that's that's the kind of things that I don't want to see. I don't think that that's indicative of uh, of a healthy society. And on the flip side of that, I mean, I'm certainly not sticking up for the mom and her behavior, but you know that obviously is a criminal charge, right, Matt? It, it, oh yeah, it, absolutely. So, so now you're, oh, yeah. you, and, and that mom probably wouldn't have been there without being on drugs and, and doing that and forgetting that her drugs were in there or whatever it was. Now she's spending, if there was fentanyl, the rest of her life in jail. We've come for, full circle from the beginning of the conversation. Matt, is it also a crime, the same crime, if mom left her, her prescribed Valium accessible to the kids and the kid took it and, and, and died is that also a crime it could be yeah absolutely or if you leave a loaded firearm out maybe yeah. there's another you know go down that same use that same logic anything dangerous you could leave out could potentially resulting in a criminal charges absolutely so that's outside the argument of legalizing drugs it kind of yeah, takes it outside of that yeah. yes yeah but i don't think she would have done that if she wasn't on drugs i might be speculating i don't know well, 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 I mean, I mean Molly's it, it, kind of a a party drug, and there's a difference. I like, don't even know what it is. I don't know what it is either. Sorry. People, it's, M it's MDMA. It's it's still. Yeah, it's not, not something that you want your child getting into. No, okay. absolutely not. But but it's not something that people normally take every day, and they have to they have to take it every day to for maintenance purposes, like like fentanyl and heroin. So the first time, and maybe I'm going to ask you this, Gina, because you, you dealt with people on a first-hand level. Uh, the first time somebody does heroin or fentanyl, they get high, right? And they're doing it to get high. And then is it an immediate, you know, I do it the next time and I, I, I have to do a little more because I got it's not as good? Or how does that work? How does that that's, that's pretty much exactly how it works. Someone will take X amount. They will feel that euphoric and intense high. And they obviously, most of the time, people will want to feel that feeling again. So they will use again. But what, you, what they will notice the second time is that they won't be able to achieve that same level of high, which means they have to increase the amount that they use. So they might be able to get close to that original amount, if they, that original high, if they use more. And that cycle just continues to the point where the, the amount that they're using is, is very high and they're not feeling anything close to what they used to because the withdrawal symptoms are, are so intense that they get stuck in this cycle where they have to use so they don't feel sick. And that's why a lot of people came into my clinic and that's what a, a lot of the patients that I had to deal with, they were just tired of using because they were tired of feeling like they were going to die all the time. And it's my understanding from, my, from what I've learned, uh, I've never experienced painful opiate withdrawal, but Nine out of ten people that I interacted with told me that they would rather die. So I can imagine that it's something that is pretty awful 
but a lot of the people that I dealt with, they came to the clinic and they wanted to get better because they were tired of using. They don't want to use anymore. And it was mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversation. Nobody does heroin for the first time wanting to become uh, a desolate heroin addict. It's just something that occurs. It's the consequences of, of the actions. But, um, yeah, they, the, the quantity that you have to use over time in order to replicate the original effects, it, it, goes, it gets higher and higher and higher to the point where it does become dangerous. And it does, you know, the withdrawal is, is un, unbelievably unbearable for, for a lot of people. And that's what causes a lot of them to treat, uh, seek treatment, treatment. You know, you will experience withdrawals after three days of opiate use. Like if you got a prescription, that's what's been reported to me is is in studies that three days, three days. Right. That's you get a teeth, a tooth pulled, and or a minor surgery, you'll get fifteen to thirty days of of prescription drugs to for the pain and discomfort. And if you follow the doctor's directions, at the end of that, you will have withdrawals. Okay, I. I I call foul on that. I had spine surgery. I was a zombie for four or five days at least because, you know, any orthopedic, orthopedic pain is bad pain. Some right? people will experience. Some people, I, I not, th but, but your experience is not everyone's experience, John. Well, okay. I just want to make sure that it's not a, it's not, it's not an a, automatic After addiction. three days, uh, yeah. you're going and, to. And that's, a, and that's a fair point. And that's a, and that's a good point that some people will experience. But somebody like me who smokes and drinks, you know. Oh, you're. Uh, I'm, I'm done. You're not even. I, I don't even phased. It's gonna be like a Tylenol for <laughs> <Right>. you. <laughs> you know, it occurs to me. I came of age in the '60s and '70s, and there was a unified message in schools about drugs. This is before, you know, Nancy Reagan and all of this. The unified message was: if you do, then it was LSD and and pot and I guess heroin, but nobody heroin was for those weird people in the movies, right? But it was it was a unified message that if you use this once, you're going to be addicted. And it resonated and a loser with me. For the rest of your life, right? Right. And all the way through through college, I say this, you know, I guess with some degree of of yeah, mod. I don't know what it is, but I, I I'm one of the children of the '70s. Went through college in the '70s and never did any drugs. Never smoked pot. Never did. I drank my weight in beer, right. but I didn't do any any drugs. And I think it's because that message was drilled into me so much. Now the message is not unified. And, and I'll, I'll take that further. I, I went to a Catholic school. I was told, if you sin, you will go to hell. And, and that's what we were taught all through school. And I certainly believed it because anytime I did something wrong, I got wrapped with the ruler or wrapped, sent to the headmaster. Um, you know, it, we don't teach those virtues anymore, in my opinion. That's why well, I think there is a, a critical need for uh, the, the unified message. I think we, across the board, need to get on to the, um, the, so, the social idea of drugs are bad. And that's, why, that's yet another reason why I can't get behind the, the libertarian idea of just legalizing everything. Because if we send a, a mixed message like, well, drugs aren't really that bad, I think that's going to pique a lot of kids' curiosities in, in a lot of bad ways. As we know, kids get curious and younger people get into just stupid things anyway. So the last thing we need is some authoritative figure telling them that, you know, oh, it's your life. You can do what you want. Go experiment. Have fun. Be safe. I don't think that's the message that we need to send if we want to bring up healthy and well-adjusted people. So, so on the recovery side then, Gina, is opening a bunch of methadone clinics the right thing to do? Or is methadone the answer for, for the, to start the, the process? I know uh, Scott Eckert, Delegate Scott Eckert, was very uh, vocal about restricting the amount of methadone uh, clinics in an area or in a population. Can you elaborate on that? Right, so he and I had a pretty productive conversation about it. I presented him with the idea of uh, my original bill, which was to remove the, the cap that we had on methadone facilities. But after talking with him and talking with a few other people, um, I realized that I don't think that that's the route that we, that we want to go. So the, the, the bill that I approached with him, the, the, the revised version, the second version, is that I wanted to double the number of methadone facilities in the state, which there's only 10, the moratorium allows for 10 facilities right now. Right. My bill would have allowed for 20 with a maximum of one per county. His major concern was more facilities purposely opening up in his county just so and, they- And they're, those, shipping, they're shipping people in from all over the-, the, they're, the they're, Which county is from his? all over the place. So I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna 
you know, bird in his area. I understand he has a need to protect his people, protect his county. So I don't want to unnecessarily burden him and create an uh, artificial market for that kind of thing to encourage further shipping of people. But I personally believe that increasing the overall number of methadone facilities, even by a modest amount, my bill said a maximum of one per county if there's not already one in there. And which one uh, did we pass out of the House, Gino, that, that did pass? The, the only thing that we did was it was something that was specific to his county. To his county. It, it restricts the overall number of inpatient beds. And what, what, uh, what city is Scott in again? He is in Parkersburg. Parkersburg, okay. Wood County? Yeah, Wood County. Um, so I, I, I can understand why. He was against the initial idea, but my second version of the bill, he was on board with, and he actually co-sponsored with me because okay. he explained why, you know, he was motivated by what he was, and I think we came to came to an agreement. Now, some people lie about what my bill actually did to the caucus because a lot of people have very strong feelings about methadone in general, and I understand their concerns. I've seen all of the negative stereotypes come to life when I've worked in a methadone clinic. However, I personally, from what I've seen, I cannot ignore the success and the life that has been restored to so many people in Mon County from my, from the clinic that I worked at alone because of their conscientious decision to choose recovery, to make themselves better, and use methadone along the way. A lot of people call methadone a crutch. Well, when you break your ankle, you're going to need crutches before you get better. I've seen a lot of success. And what's I the can't average, deny that. Uh, does, it, does it different for everybody, Gina? Was there an average time to recovery? with the methadone. The recovery is different for everybody. It looks different for everybody. Methadone affects everybody differently. Some people might feel certain side effects. Some people might feel none. Some people are good to go after six months. Some people I saw them, they were on long-term maintenance on it for, for 10 years. And a lot of people say that, you know, you can't have someone take in this prescription for, for 10 years. And ideally you wouldn't have someone on it that long-term. However, if someone is able to return to the workforce, if someone is able to return to normal life, but only if they have this prescription, I can't, I can't see what's wrong with that really. You know, I mean, ideally someone gets into the program, they take the amount of required methadone for the period that they have to, and then they wean off and then they no longer need to take it. That's ideal. But if someone gets into the program and they're able to, you know, return to, to work or go back to their families as a fully functioning human being, even though they take methadone, I just, I can't, I can't be against that. So, Gina, we got about a minute and a half left. Looking forward, what do we look forward for? What what Gino bills are coming? Because, because uh, you know, Mr. George Street and I are very excited to see what Gino's cooked up for next session. I got a lot of things brewing. Don't worry. Um, I think we're going to look at the results of that study resolution, and that's something that me and Kayla Kessinger are probably going to work on uh, together because she's very, very knowledgeable about this issue, so I would like to see something like that. And of course, I'm going to revisit uh, our need for um, some sort of meaningful fight against against addiction, uh, as always. I don't want to reveal too much, Mike, because where would, what would the fun in that be? <laughs> and I heard you, you're, uh, you're going to be a roommate. Is that, is that a true rumor? Uh, the rumors are, in fact, true. Me and Delegate Mike Hornby will... Because <laughs> uh, uh, height made me take a bed frame down there. And I figured, uh oh, somebody else is moving in. I was trying to find, who, find out who it was. <laughs> Gino, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks for giving us your time, and uh, I'll see you at in interims.